Thank you. So we'd like to begin uh, with a land acknowledgement and um, I'm going to invite everyone uh, to, to put their own land acknowledgements in the chat and at the end of, of this one, because uh, it's, it's really important in the work we do and speaking about just transition, and we'll speak more about that in a moment, um, to acknowledge that, that um, a just transition must include everyone and, and must be grounded in, um, in indigenous rights and in decolonizing. So part of why we do land acknowledgements is acknowledging the history of the land that we work, that we that we play, that we live on, that we um, that that we may worship on, and, uh, and not only just acknowledging who was there first, but also um, acknowledging the history of that land and the ways in which um, we uh, have collectively and individually participated in that history. Um, so the land that uh, the land that I am on currently uh, is the traditional territory of the Huron Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of uh, the Credit. And um, it is on a uh, land. It, it's land that's covered by the Williams Treaty. Um, I live in what is now called Ajax. This land has seen a lot of history. Um, it has seen a history of colonization. Um, it has you know, been witness to uh, broken promises and broken relationships. And while we express, and while I express gratitude um, for the chance to live here today, um, I, I, do so with, uh, I do so with sorrow for the history in which, um, in, in which we have in many ways participated and I have participated in um, and how we are working now to, to take that history in a new, um, in a new direction of, of justice and reconciliation. Um, so I do invite people um, to start putting their own land acknowledgements in the chat now. What you see in front of you is um, a word image that, that was created, uh, as you probably remember, there, there was a registration form that you filled out and, and it asked some questions about some hopes and fears that you may have had. Um, and so these words that you see in front of you um, are, are, all from that, um, are all from that registration form. So these are all words that different people uh, who are sitting at this table right now have, um, have submitted into that form. Um, and as I was looking at, at this collection of words, and then you know, we made this, uh, we made this word art here, it it just it struck me what um, what an important collection of, of uh, words and history and concepts this is and how um, and how well it describes the need for a just transition and many of the ways in which a just transition um, must take place. So first we're going to ask, um, you know, how are climate justice and a necessary transition related? Um, and one of the, whenever, whenever we talk about um, climate and climate change, um, we, we tend to want to um, make sure that we root those discussions in human relationships, human relations to what we commonly call the environment, right? Um, uh, so creation. Um, and, and also to each other. Um, and of course, humans are part of creation. Um, you know, we're not somehow separate from it, uh, which is another thing that sometimes uh, we need to remind ourselves of. Um, but, but it's important to keep those relations to each other um, in, in mind when we're speaking about climate change, as well as the very important relationship that we have with the earth and that the earth has with um, you know, with the plants and animals that also um, that also call this earth home. Um, so these discussions about uh, climate and, and climate justice and, and uh, just transition are centered on what um, what we note are observations of harm. And I don't think I likely have to you know convince anyone on on this particular call that there are that there are harms. Um, that have um, <laughs> that, that we are doing to the environment. Um, you know, we've already spoken a little bit about some uh, with fires. Uh, certainly, there've there've been increased um, flooding and storms, and and uh, you know, we're we're starting to really 
see some of the studies that are coming out on that um, famine. Um, and so moving from those observations of harm, taking them seriously, uh, that's when that's when many people start talking about well we need we need to change we need to make a transition and it has to be a just transition um, it has to be rooted in justice um, and that means moving away from practices that harm the environment um, so acknowledging that our practices are currently harming the environment and then moving away from those um, in ways that also support um, you know the humans uh, whose lives are impacted and. And this point is really key, both by um, climate change and by the need to move to a, um, to a cleaner economy. Um, and so th those things are, are held, um, I don't wanna say intention because it's, it's not um, necessarily, it doesn't have to be a confrontational thing, but held in, you know, tension as in woven together um, that, um, that this is how we need to move into a just transition. So just going on some background, if we can do the next slide. Um, when we speak about uh, climate justice and the need for a just transition, um, using words like justice, um, it's important to note sets uh, all of those observed harms, it sets our actions, um, it's actually actions, actions that we hope to take in the framework of right and wrong. Um, because anytime you're speaking about justice, there, there is a framework of this is right or appropriate or good and, and to not do something, you know, whenever we're speaking of justice um, is an injustice, right? Is wrong, is harmful, is, is not good. Um, and so we have to keep in mind that framework as well as um, when we're speaking about justice. Uh, so that's sort of a, a moral framework, if you will. And then there's a legal framework as well. Um, that that indicates that there are certain responsibilities uh, that uh, that we have when we're talking about a just transition and that we're asking, for example, the government um, to take notice of and, and to work from. So next slide. Now it's worth asking um, why, uh, why is the church speaking on this? I, I have a lot of people frequently reach out and, and say, okay, fine, but why? Why, why is the church talking about this? Why, are, why should Christians care about this specifically? This is a, you know, a secular issue. Um, and, um, and, and respectfully, I, I, think that, uh, I think that it's not um, a secular issue. This is something that Christians should deeply care about and must, in fact, deeply care about, even as it also um, is well outside, uh, you know, for people who are, not, uh, who are not Christian, who also care very deeply um, about this. So why do Christians care? Why must Christians care? Um, as I've noted here, the church is called to witness and to be the body of Christ in the world. And all of what we say, all of what the church says, does, and is silent on, stands as a public witness. And we know that um, speaking, uh, you know, as we speak for the church, um, for other times in the church's history where we have harmed, or been silent when we should not have been. And that has also stood as witness um, and not the kind of witness that we would necessarily want to give. And so we must care about the harm that is going on to creation, um, which God loves, which God said that God loved um, and called very good. Um, and for Presbyterians um, in living faith, which is a subordinate standard of, of the Presbyterian church, um, Presbyterians profess that, as it says here, God is always calling the church to seek mm -hmm. justice in the world and to be concerned with well-being of life, where we welcome the truths and insights of human skill and science. So this is this is something um, th that that the church professes, and uh, and notes that it also calls us to explore ways of love and justice in respecting God's creation and seeking its responsibilities for the common good. And uh, you know, again. I'm sure it comes uh, as, as uh, I wouldn't have to convince anyone um, on this call, but harming creation is not respecting it. Um, that's, that's not respect. Um, that's not how you show respect and love in a relationship. And so this is how we need to really relook at and, and reground ourselves in the actions that we're taking. So um, we should use 
the church's voice then and our own individual voices to call on authorities um, and those who have the power to do so, including where we find power in our own life to help shape that kind of world that allows all of creation, including us, um, but not just us humans to flourish. Next slide. Thanks so much, uh, Allison. Um, and before I get into this slide, I just wanted to say thank you to Allison and to Catherine and to, to Grace and to all of you who are here um, for this opportunity to spend time with you today. Um, I actually wanted to take a little step back to give a bit of context as we before we sort of lean into some of the, the key issues that, that Allison has named. Um, and these are pieces that may be familiar to some, but may be new to others. So we just wanted to sort of set, uh, as I say, some context for some of the conversation that we're gonna have. Of course, one of the big ones, um, when we look at what Canada needs to do and what we all, how we all need to engage in the climate emergency is the Paris Agreement from the end of 2015, where nearly 200 countries from around the world signed on and committed to taking action to hold global temperature rise to two degrees above pre-industrial, two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels with uh, all efforts to hold it to 1.5. The image that is on this slide where it says 1.5 degrees is life is actually from the most recent uh, UN climate negotiations that took place at the end of 2021 in, in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, so this is something that's very much still on the minds um, of people who are engaged and who are watching and um, who are interested in, in climate justice. Um, bringing it home then, there was, I mean, there were a jump from 2015 to 2021. There were a, a lot of important moments between 2015 and 2021, but for the purposes of today's discussion, I wanted to sort of come to sort of the current Canadian context, which is in the spring, actually uh, a year ago tomorrow, um, our prime minister announced that we would raise our emissions reductions target to reducing emissions to 40 to 45% below 2005 levels by 2030. And this was a significant jump up from the 20% 20, uh, 20 below 2005 levels by 2030 that had been previously committed. Um, though as we will get to a little bit later, there are still a lot of questions in terms of whether, um, well, I don't know, but there's some discussion about whether this is, is adequate. And um, a lot of research internationally has shown that it does not represent a fair share contribution by Canada. The other piece that came out last year that built on some earlier discussions was around um, creating a net zero economy, having Canada become net zero by 2050. And really what that means is that uh, we reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible um, and that um, any uh, emissions that cannot be uh, eliminated are um, offset either or captured or um, so that at the end of the day, what we come out to is net zero. Uh, and then just a couple of weeks ago, um, our environment climate change minister presented uh, Canada's new emissions reductions plan, which is actually um, the first plan under the legislation related to uh, achieving net zero by 2050 uh, and to correspond to, to lay out how the federal government sees uh, climate action um, in order to achieve, in this instance, they chose the lower end of the 40 to 45% target, but what Canada is going to do. So a lot of this is sort of what's been agreed internationally what is our federal government committed to in kind of where we at right now? And this is all very current. I think um, we're two, three weeks now from the emissions reductions plan. Um, and um, one of the things actually that was not, that was mentioned, but not included in the emissions reduction plan was any specific follow through on previous commitments to invest in a just transition. Next slide, please. There's a couple of things when we talk about transition that um, are really important to keep in mind when we look at sort of the current state of the Canadian economy. Um, and I've drawn from a research from a few different uh, sources here. Um, but, uh, and earlier Allison mentioned that when we talk about impacts, there is both the, the impact of climate change on different groups of people and also the impacts uh, 
of climate solutions or climate action that is not born uh, equally across, um, across society. But a few things when we look at sort of economics and the labor market um, is that Indigenous workers in Canada are 12% more likely to be precariously employed and they're likely to earn about 7% less than non-Indigenous employees. Um, and this is specifically among full-time construction workers. Um, and then separate from that, 26.3, uh, nope, 23.6% of Indigenous people um, experienced poverty in 2016, and this is just where our data was available, compared to 13.8% of non-Indigenous people. So overrepresented among those precarious employed, living in poverty, uh, and earning less money than others. Uh, racialized immigrants um, are also, uh, they face a number of barriers, um, including in the skilled trades. And some of this has to do with who they know and the professional networks that they might or might not have. Uh, discrimination continues to play um, significantly into this, especially when it comes to hiring practices and also the financial resources to get accredited or to, to support themselves in moving into the skilled trades. It's also interesting that among immigrant groups, African-born immigrants have the highest unemployment rate of all immigrant groups in Canada. And when we look specifically at the energy sector, sector uh, women earn 17% less than men in coal mines and 23% less in electricity. In electricity. Sorry, I got caught up there looking at all the lesses that I wrote on that count, that 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 line. But um, Part of this too is that there are more barriers to um, women's employment in the energy sector. And often women are overrepresented, overrepresented in those industries sort of surrounding, when you think about sort of service industries and, and others in areas where there is a high concentration of energy work. So next slide, please. So we've talked um, already about you know, well, and even in the title of this webinar, we're talking about a just transition and making the just transition. So we want to spend a few minutes now just looking at, well, what does that mean? Um, because at the end of the day, one of the challenges that we have is that it's language that's used across a range of sectors and in a range of contexts, but um, is understood differently. Really fundamentally, there are two principles that define a first transition, a just transition. And the first one is that it is a transition towards an environmentally sustainable economy and society. So it's something that is part of addressing our Paris climate commitments and reducing emissions. And the second part of it though, is that the burden of change, so this is a change that we all require and we will all benefit from ultimately, but it needs to be shared across society. So that's to say that it's not just those say who work in oil and gas that need to take on the burden of change, but it's something that is that needs to be shared across society. Next slide, please. So in its simplest um, sort of iteration, what we have is sort of people who, workers who have good secure jobs now moving to good secure jobs um, in other sectors. So going from fossil fuels, for example, to renewables. Um, what's interesting when we look at that is that there's research done by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives that points to the, the fact that the main recipients of any federal supports that have uh, already been given in, the, in, in transitions, and this is something Catherine's going to talk about later, um, have benefited Canadian-born white males working in oil-dependent industries who earn an average median income of over $130,000 a year. And I think it's important to say here that this, my message is not these people should therefore not be supported, but we need to look at that support in that broader context where there are significant other elements of society, women, indigenous people, racialized communities, that are already excluded. Um, and so there is this, uh, this essence of a just transition that needs to go beyond a straight line um, for this one particular group of workers. Next slide, please. I've had the opportunity recently to do some work with uh, Sister Sue Wilson, um, who um, I think articulated some of these definitions better 
than I ever than I ever could. So that I'm borrowing from her here. So for the the first definition is what we were just talking about. So it supports and skills training programs for workers who will lose their jobs in coal, in oil, in natural gas sectors. So it is that straight line, essentially workers from one sector to another. Broadening that out a bit, we can look to concern for all workers, businesses and communities and regions with economies that are currently dependent on fossil fuel production. So we can look at uh, entire communities that are built around the coal sector or places in Northern Alberta where everything is centered around the oil patch. Um, and there too, it's, it's good to broaden that out because of course it's not only people who are directly employed in oil and gas that are impacted or coal if those industries um, are reduced. The third piece, and I think this is where there, we start to have some resonance at Citizens for Public Justice. And as far as um, I can tell, though I'm not gonna speak directly for Allison or Catherine, but within the Presbyterian Church, is to look at a just transition as a way of integrating efforts to tackle climate change and inequality at the same time. Because both are rooted in systems of exploitation um, and differentiation and um, sort of just moving ahead without uh, concern for environmental impact or for social impact um, beyond, uh, by, beyond financial motives. Um, I've generalized that a little bit, but I think that's sort of the essence of it there. And finally, um, Sister Sue says that we can think of uh, a just transition as a moral issue that's theologically rooted in an understanding of the sacredness, sacredness of creation with its interconnected web of relationships. Uh, and I think that's, this goes back to a bit of what Allison was saying earlier in terms of why are we as people of faith, why are we as Christians uh, called to care uh, about, uh, about not just about climate change or inequality, but how all of these pieces fit together. Next slide, please. What's interesting is um, even within the international labor community, um, so when you look to the International Labor Organization, they've, set, uh, they've laid out a, a set of guiding principles for a just transition. Um, and the first one is the development of a strong social consensus supported by ongoing consultation. And that's where I think these kinds of conversations that we're having today are really important because we can't um, kind of get behind something if we don't understand what it is and what's implied. Um, the second one is accounting for the gendered impacts of climate change. Uh, I've talked a little bit about um, sort of the gendered impacts of employment in the traditional energy economy, but we know that often it's women who are on the front lines and more directly impacted, um, whether it's in the global south or the far north or, or elsewhere from uh, the impacts of climate change. The third is establishing a coherent and enabling environment for enterprises, workers, investors, and consumers. And part of what I think is really interesting here is despite the lag and despite the rhetoric, both from our federal government that says, yeah, we're gonna get to this and some provincial governments that are like, whoa, no, we don't wanna, we don't wanna talk about a just transition because that suggests that something's not working here. And you know, we wanna just compete, keep supporting an, uh, industry as it is. There are many across groups of consumers and workers um, and even businesses that are saying just, let's get clear on the rules so that we know what is required, what are the regulations, what are the timelines, how do we, how can we act in this? Because without knowing, it's much more difficult to make decisions at, at any number of levels. The next one is that the just transition focus on the creation of good jobs with adequate and sustainable social protection. Uh, so this is making sure that those workers that are well-employed now continue to be well-employed and so too are those in their, in their communities and societies, as well as those who have um, previously been excluded. And finally is awareness of the specific national conditions. And it's interesting because I think this is one where that our governments at various levels often look to, that we're big, we're cold, um, we've, you know, so that, so heating and cooling in Canada is such a major issue, transportation, such a major issue. Um, and there's truth to that, um, but there are also other models that we can look to of, of nations that share similar characteristics that have, uh, have uh, been able to address this in a, in a better way. 
Um, next slide, please. So if we look at um, what does all of this mean, both in terms of some of the, 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 the framing that we got uh, from Sister Sue and also these principles from um, the International Labor Organization, there's four areas that I think um, are really important to consider when we think about a just transition in Canada. First is that it prioritizes the rights of Indigenous people um, and that this is done while upholding the principle of free prior and informed consent, um, which is part of, uh, but also needs to include the broader framework of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. We now have legislation in Canada that says that this will be operationalized and uh, within Canadian laws and practices. Um, and there's, you know, an action plan needs to be developed within the next couple of years, but we need to make sure that that, that does indeed uh, move forward. Um, the second one is to really consider the well being of people living on the margins. Um, so that we do look at the systemic barriers, um, racism, um, different prejudices that play out uh, so that we can address uh, domestic poverty and inequality as well. Um, related to that is the integration of racialized communities um, and so that it isn't it, that it isn't a, sort of an us and them sort of approach, but that we look at advancing the well-being of everyone in Canada. Um, and that in doing all of this, we also um, are mindful of the livelihoods of oil and gas workers and communities. So that as we invest in low carbon energy development, there is funding for skills development and retraining so that people that are well employed now will continue to be well employed uh, in the future. Next slide, please. So here is really just, I think, a, a synthesis um, of some of the factors that, uh, that I think we all need to be mindful of when we consider what it is to make the just transition, that it be based in justice, inclusivity, that it's sustainable, both in terms of sort of longevity for the people involved, but also uh, environmentally, that there's a focus on good, secure, uh, green jobs. Um, and there, I think it's important to say that this doesn't necessarily mean that it's only limited to the oil and gas sector, but as we come out of, hopefully, the pandemic, one of the things that I think a lot of people are, are mindful of is the strain that some of the, the, uh, the care sectors have been under. When we, so we look at you know, the issues in hospitals, in, in schools, in other places, and we don't often think of these, these jobs in the climate context, but they're low carbon jobs and social work. There's a whole bunch of these areas that, if, that are desperately in need of of support and development. Um, and I think we need to remember those as part of how Canada can approach climate solutions. Um, we do need to, of course, to make this uh, compatible with no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius in warming. And this is something that we've heard from the international scientific community again and again, and is consistent with the teachings of indigenous people for a very long time. Uh, we re need to remove some of those sy systemic barriers. It needs to be legislated so that we know that there's some permanence and some continuity with this, and it needs to be based in principles of fairness and human rights. Next slide, please. Again, I, I mentioned that Sister Sue is more eloquent than me. I didn't really think I was going to talk about her quite so much directly, but um, if you ever have the opportunity, she's lovely. And one of the things that she says that I think wraps this all together is that our care for the earth and the climate is inextricably bound to our care for the whole human family and for all species on earth, all interacting endlessly in complex ways, all part of God's communion. Thank you, Carrie, for that. Um... The question that we then move to is, what is this connection between income security and climate adaptation? What is this, 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 the, the, what are the connecting principles of, of economy uh, and, and personal economy to climate adaptation? And how does all of this fit into uh, the principles and, and, and policies of a just transition that, that Carrie has just outlined for us, whether it's a, in a broad context or in a narrow context? Uh, and, and I'll just start with um, a very basic principle that uh, 
families with higher incomes tend to have higher carbon emissions. In the climate change policy discussion, in international uh, policy discussions, there's this talk about uh, the division between the global north and the global south, how the global north, and that's mostly Western and industrialized countries are responsible for producing the vast majority of the greenhouse gases that have warmed the, the global climate. Uh, and uh, communities uh, and nations in the global south um, who are largely poor have uh, not contributed uh, as much if at all and they also disproportionately bear the weight of the consequences of climate change. Um, now there's a UN study that that has said that this this comparison uh, between rich countries uh, being high emitters and poor countries being lower emitters actually holds up within the same country as well where people who were families uh, and households that have higher incomes uh, tend to have higher carbon emissions than families with lower incomes. Uh, and that is for a variety of reasons, but um, bigger houses have bigger carbon footprints, uh, personal vehicles have a larger, uh, have a larger footprint than, than, than using public transit. Um, more vacations, more food, more, all of these things contribute to that. All of those uh, things contribute to that uh, observation. Um, so the adverse effects of climate change disproportionately impact people who are socially and economically marginalized. There's a 2017 study that was done on behalf of the UN, and, and it says that it's not just a question of, of of economics, but it's a question of, as, as Kerry has pointed out, um, systemic barriers and systemic uh, and systemic uh, marginalization. So groups that have been racially marginalized, groups that have been economically marginalized, groups that have been socially marginalized um, tend to um, be disproportionately impacted by, by climate change. So what does this look like? Um, those inequalities are manifested in increased exposure to the negative consequences of climate change, um, to increase susceptibility to damages, uh, decreased capacity to cope and to recover. And a just transition is one that has a plan to address, uh, at least in the way that we're defining it in, in the context of this webinar, uh, has a plan to address pre-existing inequalities for groups of people who have faced barriers to income security and equality. Not just uh, not just within the climate change context, but within the broader societal context as well. Uh, the question that sort of then is next is, do we have what, what what does a just transition look like in in practice? Uh, we've looked at at definitions, at rationales, and at principles that shape what we mean when we talk about just transition. But what does that process look like? Do we have examples to draw from, and do we? Uh, and, and we do, we, we have one in, in coal-fired electricity generation. Um, coal burning has a huge impact on the de on degrading air quality and that has impacted the health of people and communities. Um, Canada obtains about 20% of its electricity from fossil fuels and coal makes up approximately 9% of power generation in Canada and that's a 2016 number. Uh, the government of Canada made a commitment to phase out coal power generation by 2030. Uh, and following that announcement, it struck a task force on a just transition for Canadian coal power workers and communities. Now there's approximately 4,000, uh, there's approximately 4,000 people directly employed in, in, this, in this industry. And they're spread across four provinces, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. And a large uh, majority of that is in, is in Alberta. Uh, and these are the people who would be impacted by this phase out. Uh, and we'll, we will actually look at uh, Alberta specifically in a moment because uh, that's where a vast majority of, uh, of the impacted workers reside. So let's just take a moment and uh, review some of what the task force, the federal task force uh, did. Uh, what were its goals? Um, to make specific recommendations to the federal government about the transition process, uh, to secure funding for a just transition by 2030, because that's the, that was the phase out date, and to organize alternative employment options, retaining social benefits in affected communities, and, and otherwise um, 
suggest or talk about the kinds of programs uh, that would help uh, employ that would help uh, employees in the sector and their communities transition. Uh, what did the task force do? A large portion of its work was actually um, extensive consultations with affected communities. Uh, they went to 20 different communities and talked with stakeholders, um, stakeholders from industry, from the working and labor field, from labor, from labor union and associations, from family members and community members. Uh, and also even, and some of this even uh, included town hall style, uh, town hall style uh, consultation. So it really was a, if you're in the community, come. Uh, what did the task force say? Um, they developed seven key aspects for just transition programs and 10 recommendations to act as guidelines for principles for the government. Uh, so they didn't come up with, you know, 50, recommend, 50 specific policy recommendations. They didn't say this policy has to be put in place, this money has to, be, has to support this policy and it has to run this length of time. Um, what they did was uh, highlight seven key aspects of just transition programs. Uh, and, the, that would, and the seven key principles are respect for workers, unions, communities, and families, uh, worker participation in every stage of transition, transitioning to good jobs, sustainable and healthy communities, planning for the future grounded in today's reality, national, coherent, regionally driven, locally delivered actions, and immediate yet durable support. So those are the, those are the principles that they developed um, that defined a just transition for the context of their task force. Um, and the key elements of, and some of the key elements of those, uh, of those 10 recommendations included upholding uh, the definition of a just transition principles throughout the process uh, to provide bridge funding uh, for those affected by, uh, by changes in, in, in their work situation uh, and investing in local infrastructure. Part of the other thing that they did, uh, including this sort of general principles and, and recommendations piece, was the preparation of a document and separately that said that, that focused on what we heard. And that was a place where they could uh, talk about specific feedback from specific air, from specific uh, parts of, of the population, whether it's workers or labor unions or the industry or family members or community members. What was the outcome? The federal government uh, committed $185 million to support affected communities across the four provinces where coal generation uh, was being phased out. $35 million was focused on local, was focused on setting up local centers to support workers uh, with, uh, with wage and pension bridging and retaining and, uh, and retraining opportunities. And that was uh, a tuition support for those who uh, were transitioning from, from coal generation to another industry uh, and other kinds of supports. And 150 uh, million, that's $150, uh, it should be 150 million is dedicated to, infrastructure, to an infrastructure fund. Um, what worked well and what were the limitations of this task force? Um, it's important to sort of sit back and, and note these things because if we're going to be using this or looking at this as an example of where a just transition program has been uh, applied, then learning from this process is kind of important, is kind of key to. Um, to future development of, of just transition programs. What worked well? It was a small and representative membership. So the group only had 10 or 12 members on it. And they were, there was a wide uh, regional representation and also representation from uh, a demographic representation. So workers and people from the labor and people, and I don't think there were people from industry directly involved in that, but there was, uh, that was part of the consultation. Um, there was clarity of task uh, with federal government support. This is key because um, there wasn't, uh, the government said, go and do this work. The task force uh, was in a position where it could independent, uh, where it could operate with relative independence of the federal government. It wasn't acting directly as say, a civil, you know, being a civil servant kind of scenario. So there was a bit of independence there, uh, which I think was helpful in terms of building relationships with uh, some of the stakeholders in this consultation process. Uh, but the federal government had also committed its support to, uh, to supporting the task force in its work and the outcomes of this work. Um, and so given that the task force uh, had a very clear, had a very clear ask, it wasn't, it wasn't sort of taking, it wasn't setting any policy, policy target directions. It wasn't concerned with timelines. 
um, because all of that had been preset beforehand. There was an end date, 2030, must be phased out by then, uh, and that this is going to happen. Um, these kinds of negotiations um, that can involve multiple stakeholders, multiple levels of government, um, the, the kinds of negotiations and, and, and conflicts that can arise from those negotiations were present in the task force because that piece of, of, the, of the conversation uh, was not part of the task force's mandate. Uh, and that gave them the ability to focus on intensive consultation with local stakeholders. What were some of the limitations? Uh, the definition of just transition is not built specifically or, or uh, it doesn't highlight uh, a rights-based framework. It doesn't specifically say free prior informed consent, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, and it doesn't highlight human rights as a part of its uh, principles and its framework. Um, it was limited to, it was also limited to affected communities. It wasn't brought in scope or addressing some of the pre-existing uh, pre systemic injustices. Uh, and the mandate was to facilitate a predetermined action and timeline. Uh, so in, in other countries where, where they've had a broad, where, where, tra where task forces on just transition have had a broader mandate, um, they've also not had um, the capacity to do sort of the in-depth consultation work that this task force did, but they also uh, were not, but they were, they were also involved in, in setting a predetermined action and timeline. And I'm certain that when you don't include um, consultation about targets and timelines as a part of a just transition process, um, that there are some people who are gonna be upset by that. Um, so that's part of uh, what, what worked, what didn't work, depending on the perspective you're bringing to the analysis. Um, there's also a, a slightly smaller focus with, that we can give to, to coal and the question of a just transition. The Alberta government um, announced a coal phase out uh, in 2016. Uh, this would affect some 3,100 workers uh, in about 20 towns uh, where coal was mined and processed. And most of the workers affected in the mining were, are mostly affected workers in this provincial process were in the mining and processing uh, part of things rather than just running plants. Um, about half of Albertans uh, supported the phase out, which means that half didn't. So this was a fairly, uh, this, this was not a unanimous uh, public decision. Uh, one of the sticking points is that, uh, and, and when, you, when you talk to some of the workers who were uh, affected, by, the, by this provincial transition. One of the sticking points is that the tuition benefits, uh, and this would be, so if a worker is uh, not going to, you know, say, move into early retirement, but they're gonna be except retraining into, uh, into, a, into a different industry, the tuition benefits were not available while, while they were still working and they became available after somebody was no longer working. Um, and this was seen as a, as a huge challenge or problem with the, with the program benefits in that specific context. Um, the transition program did include payouts to coal companies and agreements to transition some facilities uh, from coal to natural gas. Uh, and, and because of this, um, because of this, it, it doesn't necessarily meet a sustain, like it doesn't tick the box of long-term sustainability because if you're moving, you're basically moving from one form of non-renewable to another form of non-renewable. Um, so, so there will eventually be have to be additional kinds of transitions or additional kinds of uh, adaptations that will need to be made. It's not a long-term solution. Uh, but because of the nature of the consultations that happened uh, in, the, in the process of the, of the government uh, doing, uh, leading this uh, transition, um, the transition packages, as they were negotiated, uh, it was actually quite surprising because there was a lot of connection uh, with the uh, coal labor union vis-a-vis -vis the coal transition coalition, a coalition of, of workers that was trans that was made, and uh, they're actually and they're actually developed a lot of relationships with that, and so. Um, not all industry stakeholders were on board, but there was actually because of the relationship that was formed between the labor between the labor associations uh, and and the people who were determining um, who were determining the kinds of uh, benefits packages that were going to come out of this process. Um, there was a relatively good working relationship that was there, and having strong and one of the key findings of uh, academic studies that have looked at uh, just transition 
uh, processes across uh, the com across not just across the country but across the globe. One of the key things uh, that determines whether or not a just transition process uh, works well for workers is whether or not there is a strong uh, labor association or labor movement within that industry and within that region. Um, the stronger the labor union, the stronger the the stronger the success or the, the, the success of the just transition uh, program within that place. Um, yep, so the compensation plan affected approximately 3,000 workers and was uh, approximately valued at $45 million. And this covered uh, bridge funding to retirement. So workers who weren't uh, quite at retirement uh, but had and, and weren't eligible for pension yet, there was bridge funding for that. Relocation costs if they had to move more than 40 kilometers away from the community to find new work and tuition for retraining. So the bigger question here is, how, what does this mean for a just transition national in Canada? Um, the just transition programs we've been talking about are at a fraction of the scale that is needed to address uh, the oil and gas industry in Canada as a whole. And we have to talk about oil and gas because oil and gas is the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases um, in the country. Uh, its value, its economic value as an industry is about $140 billion per year and 7% of the Canadian GDP. So we have to talk about this. Uh, the number of workers in the Canadian uh, coal industry is somewhere around 4,000. Uh, the number of workers directly employed in the oil and gas sector in Canada is somewhere around 150 to 200,000. And if you include the number of people who are indirectly connected to the industry, this number jumps to about 600,000. Uh, Nicholas Stern is a British economist, and he was asked to do uh, an economic report on the cost of climate change. How much would it take to adapt? Uh, his first report came out, I think, about 2007, and, uh, he, and within a few years, he actually doubled his estimate. Uh, so when you factor in his calculations into a Canadian context, uh, it's to the order of, of about 25 to $50 billion per year. So the question of how much does Canada need to change? How much does Canada need to spend in order to uh, in order to adapt to climate change? Uh, his Nicholas Stern's estimates are about twenty-five to fifty billion dollars per year, and that's on all climate change spending. But what might this look like uh, in a just transition to a just transition program cost? It's a difficult question to answer because it depends on the scope of the program. Do you factor only in, do you take a narrow focus and do you factor in only uh, affected workers in the industry? Um, there's actually a higher, there's actually a really high worker exit rate per year in the oil and gas industry, it's somewhere around 10%. Uh, so do you only focus on some workers or do you focus on all workers? Uh, do you take a broad training approach and offer direct training to both workers who are transitioning from pre-existing jobs in oil and gas into other jobs in the green sector, into the renewable sector, or do you set up a program that could broadly reach, that could broad, that could broadly encompass training for marginalized groups of people, uh, and that's where you would be uh, addressing some of those uh, some of those systemic barriers. Um, and so, depending on how broad, if you go for a broad training program, that would be an investment of hundreds of millions of dollars or more, depending on the number of people being trained per year. So these are the kinds of questions that factor into a just transition program and what would be needed at the scale of shifting our economy towards more than just uh, towards a more just and sustainable path. The total costs would be somewhere in the billions of dollars per year. But if I could restate some of the questions and fears that were named uh, by participants here in the webinar registration that we saw in the in the breath shaped word cloud at the beginning, what is the cost? of inaction. Um, there's in, as I was preparing for this uh, presentation, I came across a, an organization uh, called Iron and Earth. And it was uh, set up by somebody who had been laid off uh, in, the oil, uh, in the oil and gas industry during one of their economic downturns uh, a couple of years ago. And here's what, here's what they said, we, the members of Iron Earth, are the hands and feet of the energy future. Since we are the fossil fuel industry workers passionate about applying our skills to build the energy industry of a net zero future. Our intention is to see that fossil fuel resources are managed sustainably while ensuring climate solutions are deployed at the scale required 
to reach net zero by 2050. And I offer that because I want to say that this is not about demonizing a sector. There are people within the sector who are passionate about what they do. They're proud of the work that they do, but they also see and they hold the same fears we have. They hold the same, the same kinds of concerns that, that other people have. Uh, and they're willing and wanting and, and finding innovative ways um, to move in that direction. So this organization, Iron and Earth, is dedicated to retraining opportunities for people who are, for workers who are in the oil and gas sector and want to be retrained for the renewable sector. Uh, so there are um, solutions that are coming out of the sector itself, which I find uh, hope giving. Finally, I just want to uh, address some of the perceived barriers to address transition. And certainly the things I will talk about is this is not an exclusive list, but these are some very, very common things that I've heard about that I've heard when talking with people about uh, a just transition. There's anxiety that a just transition will have a negative impact on the economy. And yet when you take a look at, um, when you take a look at studies, uh, the, the job growth projections surpass job losses in the energy sector. Uh, and this is under uh, a net zero uh, by 2050 scenario. Uh, some of the reasons that, uh, that job growth projection surpasses job loss is because oil and gas is a capital heavy um, is a capital heavy industry. It means you have to invest a lot of money uh, in into into the industry to make it go and into the people to who work in that industry. And there's a lot of other jobs um, where that aren't as capital intensive. It doesn't need as much capital for that um, for it to be for it to go. So that's that's why the transition. You're moving from something that's uh, an industry that's entirely capital heavy to other things that are less capital heavy. Um, there's conflicts or perceived conflicts between stakeholders. Uh, and so an example might be between environmental groups and, and the industry itself. And yet uh, a recent poll among oil and gas workers, and it was run uh, by the, by the uh, organization that I just quoted from Iron and Earth. Uh, and it says that uh, it was run, but, uh, it was done with 300 oil and gas uh, sector workers. And it reveals uh, a, a strong willingness to transition to new types of technology and to renew into a renewable sector. 88% of those polled said, yes, this is a necessary change and yes, we'd be willing to make it. Um, and again, when you talk about what were the anxieties of those workers, it's reduced wages, it's investments of time and money and retraining, reduced hours, benefits and compensation and forced early retirement. These are the kinds of anxieties that I think we all have about any kind of transition. Uh, the other kinds of anxieties that get named are scale and scope and the urgency of the timeline uh, for the tra for transition plans. We have to do it now. It's huge, uh, and and it has to have this sort of very long long view. It can't just be something that's tied to political election cycles. It can't just be a four year program. It has to it has to and necessarily has to uh, go across um, decades. Uh, and yet, so there are examples we can learn from. I, you know, we, we've learned certain things from, from, from transitioning away from coal. It's an ongoing process, it's still happening. Uh, there are other countries and other, and other states that are making these transitions. And so learning what works, learning what doesn't work uh, and being reflexive, a plan, a just transition plan nationally has to be reflexive. It has to learn as a group, it has to intentionally uh, take into consideration uh, on the ground circumstances and be ready to pivot as necessary. Thank you, Catherine. And just just building on what uh, we've already said here, um, it, it it can't be stated enough how vital it is that any just transition um, that is that is attempted, that is worked on, um, must be done um, in in conversation, in consultation, um, in full collaboration with all parties. So. Um, the justice, uh, as we say here in just transition, has to be justice for everyone, not just for some. Um, and that means, um, in a large part, leaning in to conversations around decolonization. It means learning our history, where we went off, where we went wrong, 
It means acknowledging our harms. It means looking at the systemic barriers that are in place. Uh, it means looking at the systemic injustices that are already here and trying to address them, trying to uh, try, trying to take them away um, and, and to move in a, a, better, a better direction where we have justice for all, because only in doing so will we be able to have the kind of, the kind of society, the kind of world uh, that is needed. So when we're talking about just transition, um, it, it has to have that, that consultation element to it. And uh, Catherine and Carrie have already spoken about several of the different communities and examples of, of how this has already happened. Um, and, uh, and Carrie will speak in a, a few minutes um, about some of the different ways that people can plug into those conversations uh, because they are of course already ongoing. Um, but as we, uh, as we look at just transition, as we advocate for it, as, as we try and find ways um, to, uh, to get involved in conversations about what it should look like, um, it, it's important to always remember um, that, that this must be grounded in those conversations about, um, about workers' rights, about indigenous rights, um, about um, land and land back and um, all of the things that are addressing the, the actual and current and real injustices that are shaping our current society and have brought us to where we are today. Next slide. Before I move into um, some of <clears throat> some examples of what is being done and where people are coming together. I want to build on a little bit of what Allison has just said. Um, and really, it's to emphasize that we're all in this together. Um, and because of that, our failure or our success in addressing the climate crisis and achieving a just transition, that is collective. Now, as we've said here today, and as I think most people will be aware when it comes to issues of justice and injustice, the impacts, there are certain groups of people that will be impacted uh, more severely if we don't get this right. But at the end of the day, this is the, these are the kinds of changes that ultimately um, are good across society for the planet and even for the economy. Um, I think one of the things that has that has really helped me in sort of engaging in some of these conversations is to recognize that while the the some of the narrative around these issues can be quite polarizing and we're we're led to believe that you know this group believes this and this group believes that and and and, and there is truth to that but when we kind of start to peel back the later layers we can see that there's really more that unites us than divides us that at the end of the day our hopes and dreams are more similar than they are different. And I might, that might sound a little Pollyanna-ish, but I think, um, but the, 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 the conversations that I've had with people in different sectors in different parts of the country about these issues really point to that. At the end of the day, we want our families to be, uh, to have a good life. We want the natural spaces in which we live to thrive. We want, good relationships. And so I think it's, it, that's important. In order to get there, I think we need to keep listening. We need to keep sharing, but listening more than sharing, but also always being engaged in the kind of dialogue that Alice was talking about. Because um, every change we create is created in relationship and in community. So I wanted to sort of put that out there before I just spent a couple of minutes talking about the different ways um, that that different organizations and groups of people um, are, are working together and are trying to address this from a few different angles. So Catherine, if we can go to the next slide. Um, the first one I wanna mention is the For the Love of Creation initiative. Uh, this is something, it's funny that we, we kinda maybe skipped over it, um, but For the Love of Creation is something that we at Citizens for Public Justice are involved in, the Presbyterian Church in Canada is involved in, actually all of us um, have been um, on the coordinating committee. And this is a national initiative that brings together over 35 faith-based organizations. So national churches, um, groups like CPJ and Kairos, uh, Catholic religious orders, um, some interfaith uh, groups as well. 
And it came together out of, I think, a history of collaboration, but at a moment, which is actually two years ago tomorrow. So this in a lot of ways is how we're marking um, the, the two year anniversary of For the Love of Creation. Um, but out of an acknowledgement that we actually, we are stronger together. And there, these are issues that we had all been working on in our own organizations in different ways, um, but a real intentionality around coming together um, to do this work to address climate justice. Um, when I finish going through this, I'm gonna drop the websites for all of the organizations listed on this slide so that if you wanna learn more, you can, you can do that. The second group I wanna mention is Climate Action Network Canada. And this is part of an international network of climate action networks. Uh, and this brings together, I think right now, the membership is up around 130 organizations, mostly uh, environmental NGOs. But there again, we are members, Kairos is members, I think the United Church of Canada are members, um, labor unions, others who have a shared interest and concern in addressing the climate crisis. Uh, Kairos is active on these issues in their own right, um, but so too are uh, all of the member, I think, yeah, all of the member churches that are part of Kairos. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things happening in other denominations uh, and at the, at the collective corporate level as well. There's um, the, the logo right in the middle there, the Green Resilience Project, I suspect might be less familiar than some of the others to folks. Uh, and this is a project that actually is just uh, wrapped up a couple of weeks ago, but it was an initiative that brought together some of the uh, basic income or guaranteed livable income movements, looking at income security in Canada and the climate movements to look at what opportunities might there be to try to address income insecurity and the climate crisis simultaneously and what role might income support play in a just transition. So there's a report that was released based on community conversations that took place across the country. Um, we at CPJ hosted one um, in Alberta to look at sort of what are some of the challenges, what are some of the opportunities, how can these issues come together? Uh, and there's some really interesting uh, pieces that come out of that. Uh, the Green Economy Network is a, a group mostly of labor unions, but also involving some faith-based groups and um, environmental groups looking specifically at what it would mean to create one million green jobs in Canada. Uh, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives is a research organization that work, looks at a number of um, social and environmental issues, but they do excellent research around climate change and just transition. Um, you, I'm going to bet that folks here are familiar with the Presbyterian Church in Canada, so I, um, if Catherine or Allison want to speak specifically to that, I've been fortunate to be engaged through Justice Ministries um, as a Presbyterian and subsequently and uh, sort of through the years. So um, lots of great stuff happening there. Uh, Iron and Earth, as Catherine mentioned, is a worker led movement uh, in support of a just transition um, and some real thoughtful, insightful and engaged folks there. Um, and finally, uh, at Citizens for Public Justice, a lot of the work that we do um, around climate change is focused on, um, on a just transition. And for those of you who might not be familiar with us, we're a national organization of members inspired by faith to act for justice in Canadian public policy. Um, and as a membership-based organization, part of what we wanna do is bring as many people um, on board as possible so that when we engage with political leaders, um, with church leadership, with others that we can really um, speak with a strong, loud voice uh, that is representative of uh, people of faith, faith across Canada. So as I said, I'm gonna drop um, a bunch of, of links in the chat. Uh, and admittedly, the one to CPJ goes right to our Become a Member page. Um, so if you wanna be part of helping support this and carrying this work forward, I encourage you to check that out. I'm gonna pass it back to Allison in a second, but I wanna share one more reflection, having kind of got out of the, the weeds a little bit um, around what we are called to do uh, in this moment. Um, and that is that the moral summons is to lean into transformation and reconciliation, to choose the deep systemic change, which enables us to face the challenges of, the cli of climate change and inequality together. And now we're gonna move into a little bit of a practical discussion about what are some of the action steps that we can take. 
Uh, so we're just going to go over some of the things um, that the church and that members of uh, of churches can do um, before we uh, before we go into a, a slightly larger discussion and then move into questions and discussions. Um, but uh, what are some of the things the church can do? Um, really, there's there's a lot. If you haven't looked at for the love of creation yet, I I really encourage uh, I really encourage you to go and look there. There's there's quite a bit of, of ways to get involved in, um, in working on climate change and talking about it and in uh, having um, in having and hosting conversations. Um, the second bullet point that you'll see there is host a climate conversation. There are um, there are, I guess, for lack of a better word, guides that are available through For the Love of Creation to help you uh, with a script that, that helps walk you through um, conversations that you can host uh, either with friends or neighbors or, you know, at, a, at, a, at your congregations, um, at, at your city hall, whatever, um, places where, where you can bring people together to talk about these uh, vitally important issues. Um, you can engage in advocacy, and and I'll I'll um, I'll hand that off to Carrie more in a moment. Um, but there are so many different ways that uh, that advocacy can happen in so many different places um, that you can that you can plug in around that. And um, I've I've put just at the at the bottom uh, bullet point there um, the uh, Social Action Hub uh, site for the Presbyterian Church in Canada that um, that helps um, that that gives lists of, uh, of letter templates and things that can be used um, for, for writing and advocacy and for learning more about ways the church has been involved. Um, the next way is, is looking at ways that we can change our work habits and consumption. Um, so one of the things that we have mentioned um, throughout this webinar is of course that um, consumption and the rates of consumption um, in North America, uh, again, varying degrees with varying people and varying families um, are, are unsustainable. And so while uh, certainly we need to focus on corporations and holding them accountable and um, legislation and, and looking there, um, changing our own, our own corporate habits as a church and our own individual habits and our familial habits um, is, is another way uh, to, to really look at how do we how do we lower those emissions? Uh, finding ways to travel, yes, less. Using means that are less carbon intensive. Um, you know, looking at, at all of those ways. Um, advocating for ways that those are held up in, in legislation, that barriers, um, you know, to, to things that would help lower carbon emissions um, are taken away. Um, we can, it, it is also important um, that that we speak about the need for this and not only about the need for a just transition but about why it's important and uh, and to show um and to show passion and to show um that that this is something that matters and so that's that prophetic witness um that uh that we talk about in this bullet point here reflecting faithfully on the relationship uh that we have to the earth to creation um and to each other um that uh, that we know in the church that god calls people to um, and uh, and we'll um, we'll put in the chat the the link to the um, the link to the social action hub there. There's a specific page on ecological justice, but the hub in general has many other resources on different social justice issues. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Carrie. Just as we wrap up, um, I want to share an initiative that is active and live and ready for your support right now. Um, for the last number of years at Citizens for Public Justice, we've hosted um, what is called the Give It Up for the Earth campaign. Uh, strictly speaking, this runs through Lent as it's an invitation to give up something that will reduce your personal or household greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but it's not too late to, to participate. Um, because uh, then the second part of it is to um, engage with our government uh, leaders and speci specifically the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change to call for more ambitious action to address the climate crisis. And specifically this year, we're asking for follow through on existing climate action commitments, which include the end of fossil fuel subsidies, and to legislate a just transition that dismantles systemic that dismantles systems of oppression and inequality by centering Indigenous rights, that promotes fairness and inclusion, and creates good 
secure green jobs. So I'll drop that link in chat as well. And if you're able or so inclined to, to send a letter to uh, Minister Guibo or sign the letter on our website, one of the things that we will be doing in the next few weeks is reaching out to the minister's office so that we can take the letters that we've collected and have a conversation about what is required going forward. Um, at the same time, I'll mention that uh, I think I said earlier that there's been a lot said in the last few years um, about um, a just transition and about Canada's commitment to a just transition, um, though much more said than actually done. I mean, the, the, the power and pass coal, um, sorry, that's not what it was called, the coal, the task force for coal. Um, workers and communities is a really good example of something that has been done. Um, but I was sharing with uh, Allison and Catherine that I was once in a conversation in an MP's office where one of the staff people said, well, setting oil and gas aside, these are the things that we're doing to address climate change. And as, as Catherine's presentation made so clearly, we can't in this moment set oil and gas aside and we need action for a just transition. So I've just dropped, it's a rather long link, but the first link that I've dropped in the chat is to an open consultation process um, around what Canadians want to see um, in a just transition. Uh, and the second one is the, the letter to Minister Guibault. And um, I think that as part of our uh, submission from Citizens for Public Justice, I will be referencing the letters that we've collected through the campaign um, because this is this is what we're, what we're focused on. Um, and maybe really briefly, I know we're gonna to go to questions in a second, second, but I did see someone ask earlier about um, the, the income from oil and gas. And one of the things, and I don't, admittedly, I don't have a full answer. So if Catherine or Allison, if you have things to add, please do. But one of the things that's actually, find, I find really fascinating is that there are billions of dollars that are still given from the federal government to the oil and gas sector every year. There was research done by environmental defense uh, a couple of years ago that put the total at about $18 billion annually in subsidies to the fossil fuel sector. Um, so, well, I mean, Catherine really laid it out well in terms of just how much of a factor the fossil fuel sector is in the Canadian economy. One of the things that's really interesting is that we're actually using tax dollars um, to subsidize the ongoing uh, development of, of the fossil fuel sector. And even in the federal budget that was released uh, two weeks ago now, um, the largest single um, uh, line item related to the climate was uh, a tax credit to uh, corporations who were investing in um, or exploring carbon capture util and utilization technology. Um, and I mean, this is a little bit off to the side, but this is an unproven technology in that it's too often presented as sort of the silver bullet of the way that we're going to get to that net zero, um, rather than significant investments in proven, uh, in proven solutions that will ultimately actually support the development of a healthy economy in Canada. Thanks. Sign the letter now. <laughs>